Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing multi-drug transporters. Okay, so we're in the process of looking at an example of a multi-drug transporter within the major facilitator superfamily of multi-drug transporters. Specifically, we're looking at EMRD, which is from E. coli. Okay, now, we've said that EMRD proteins have this membrane-spanning topology shown here, where you have two clusters of six membrane-spanning alpha helices. So there's one cluster, and here is the other cluster. Okay, and we've said that EMRD is a secondary active transporter, and it's going to get the energy that it needs to extrude the uh, hydrophobic molecule from a proton being allowed to move from the periplasmic space back into the cytoplasm down its electrochemical gradient. Okay, right, so I want to discuss what is known about the mechanism by which EMRD uh, and other major facilitator superfamily transporters do this. Okay, so what's believed to happen is if we go from drawing uh, the uh, protein like this to drawing a simplified picture like this, again the protein is believed to have two states, okay, uh, like uh, the ABC transporters long ago. Okay, it has an inwardly facing state, which is the state we're going to start with. So here is our inwardly facing state, and then it's going to have another state in which it's in the outwardly facing state. So what then happens is firstly, whilst you're in the inwardly facing state, what will happen is a drug molecule will come and bind here. Okay, so here is our drug molecule, and then what's believed to happen is a proton is going to be moved by the protein from the um, periplasmic space into the cytoplasm. And when the proton is being moved by the protein, that triggers the conformational change in the protein that then causes it to move from the inwardly facing state to the outwardly facing state. Okay? And then in the outwardly facing state, the protein loses its affinity for the drug molecule, and therefore the drug molecule is going to detach from the binding site here. Okay? And then when the drug molecule detaches from the binding site, then what will happen is the protein will move back to being in the inwardly facing state, and then you're back to square one, where another drug molecule can come and bind to the binding site once it's in the inwardly facing state. So this is the outwardly facing state. Okay, right. So that's a very simple overview of how uh, the EMRD um, transporter works in E. coli, but not much is understood about how it works. Okay, right. So the next family of multi-drug transporters that we're going to move on to is the SMR family, which I'll just remind you, remember, stands for Small Multi-Drug Resistance Transporters. So the S is for small, the M is for multi-drug, okay, and the R is then for resistance. Okay, right. So the example of a small multi-drug resistance transporter that we're going to see again comes from Escherichia coli, okay? And it also has the same naming system of EMR, okay? So it's the EMRE transporter from Escherichia coli. Now this has um, a similar function to the EMRD transporter from E. coli in that it is also a multi-drug transporter that is this hydrophobic vacuum cleaner for E. coli that is present on the in inner membrane of E. coli just like EMRD and it also uses the proton gradient to power it however the slight difference here is that it requires two protons uh, in order to uh, move a single so substrate molecule across the inner membrane into the periplasmic space. Okay? And it also has a very different structure. So let me discuss now the structure of EMRE. So EMRE is actually made up of two separate EMRE proteins. Okay, so let me show you the structure then of an EMRE protein. So EMRE proteins only have four membrane-spanning alpha helices, like so. So here is a single EMRE protein, so we'll colour it in, in orange, I think. So this is our single EMRE protein. Now to make a functional 
active transporter that's going to be a multi-drug transporter, what you need to do is get another EMR E protein and dimerize the two together. However, this isn't as simple as it might sound, because actually the other EMRE protein that's going to dimerize with this one is going to be what's known as anti-parallelly oriented. So it's actually going to be oriented in the membrane like so. Okay, so the EMRE EMRE uh, transporter in the inner membrane of E. coli is what's known as an anti-parallel homodimer. Okay, so anti-parallel homodimer. Okay, homodimer, remember, means a dimer made out of two uh, identical proteins. Okay, and the anti-parallel refers to the fact that their orientations are opposite in this membrane. Okay, so the full EMRE transporter is made up by these two EMRE proteins which are oriented in this anti-parallel fashion. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what is understood about the mechanism of EMRE then. Okay, so this time what's believed to happen is you start off with the protons being transported onto the inner uh, aspect of the membrane and that's believed to then put the protein in the conformation where it's now inwardly facing. Okay, so it's effectively supposed to bring it into a position where it can then move the drug molecule back. Okay, so you start off with the protein in the outwardly facing state. So this is the outwardly facing state. Okay, and then what's going to happen is two protons are going to bind into the transporter. Okay, and then what's going to happen is this is going to change conformation. So I've gone from showing uh, the transporter like this to as two separate polypeptides here oriented antiparallelly to just showing the full thing like this. Okay, so the two protons bind. What that then triggers is a conformational change that then moves you into the inwardly facing state. Okay, like so. And then in the inwardly facing state, what will then happen is the two protons will dissociate from the EMRE transporter. And now, effectively, that movement of the protons was all about just getting it into this inwardly facing state, because now what can happen is a drug molecule can come and bind to the inwardly facing state here. And then when the drug molecule binds to the inwardly facing state transporter, it will, tra it will um, change in conformation again, and it will change back to the outwardly facing state. Okay, in fact I'll draw this in our separate diagram. So it will change back to being in the outwardly facing state, like so, and the drug molecule will then dissociate from the protein once it's in the outwardly facing state, and then you're back to square one, where two protons can then come bind again, move it into the inwardly facing state so that it's now in a conformation ready for uh, the movement of the drug. Okay, so effectively you're almost winding the protein up so that it's ready to do what you want it to do by moving these protons across the uh, membrane. Okay, right. So, the final group of multi-drug transporters then that we're going to discuss is the MATE transporters which, remember, stands for multi-drug and toxin extrusion family. Okay, so the M was for multi-drug. Okay, the A was for and, the T was for toxin, and the E was for extrusion. So the multi-drug and toxin extrusion uh, transporters. Okay, right. So the example of a mate transporter that I am going to tell you about is what's known as NOR-M, okay? And NOR-M is actually found in many different uh, bacteria, okay? So let me just tell you about the different bacteria that NOR-M is found in. So perhaps the most famous one is Vibrio cholerae, okay? Which is the cause of cholera, okay? Now there's a very much so related bacteria to Vibrio cholerae, which also has a NOR-M protein uh, present within it. Okay, which is what's known as Vibrio parahemiolyticus. Okay, so Vibrio parahemiolyticus. 
Okay. Now, I'll just discuss these two before we go on to the other bacterium, uh, which also has uh, a protein, uh, a NORM protein present within it. Okay, so Vibrio cholerae and Vibrio parahemiolyticus, both are rod-shaped bacteria, okay, which are gram-negative if you stain them, okay, and they both have a single polar flagellum, okay, so they have a tail, basically, and it's polarized, so the tail is on one side, so this is what's known as a single polar flagellum, because the flagellum is, oh, you only have one flagellum rather than multiple, and because it's on one side of the bacterium, okay, so it's known as a single polar flagellum, and that's used to pre propel the Vibrio cholerae and Vibrio parahemiolyticus uh, bacteria forward. Okay, now both of these are waterborne infections. Okay, so what you can, what happens is you drink water infected with Vibrio cholerae and Vibrio parahemiolyticus, and this can cause diarrheal illness. Okay, uh, so they both cause something very similar. Vibrio cholerae specifically causes cholera, uh, diarrheal illness. Okay, right. The other bacterium that has uh, a NORM protein present within it is very different. This is Neisseria gonorrhoeae, which is the uh, cause of the uh, sexually transmitted illness gonorrhea. Okay, so Neisseria gonorrhoeae. Okay, now, what does Neisseria gonorrhoeae look like? Well, it's described as a diplococcus. Okay, they are gram-negative bacterium, and they are round and they go around in pairs. So when you look at them down the microscope, you almost certainly find them in pairs. Okay, and that's why they're described as a diplococcus, because they go around uh, in pairs, and di means two. Okay, so coccus describes the fact that they're round, and they are gram-negative cocci. Okay, so this NORM transporter can be found in all of these different uh, species of bacteria. Now, of course, it will be slightly different between them. Okay, so NORM in each of the different bacterial species has a separate name. So NORM in Vibrio cholerae is called NORM VC. NORM in Vibrio parahemiolyticus is called NORM uh, VP. And NORM in Neisseria gonorrhoeae is called sorry, nor, nor mem, nor m, uh, ng, for Neisseria gonorrhoeae. Okay, right. So, uh, let me now tell you about uh, the structure of the NORM protein, and then we'll uh, just talk about how it works. Okay, right. So, let me get another piece of paper. So, the structure then of NORM. It again has the same structure that we've seen over and over again, where you have 12 membrane-spanning alpha helices clustered into two um, clusters of six membrane-spanning alpha helices. So there's that first cluster, here is that second cluster there. Okay, so this is the structure of NORM. Okay, and it basically is again a secondary active transporter that works in pretty much the same way to how we've seen EMRE works, okay, except that instead of using protons, it uses sodium, okay? So, just to go over this, so what will happen is if we go back to showing now the full transporter in this simplified way now, okay, and the transporter is made up just of a single NORM protein, so I'm now representing this NORM protein like so, it starts off in this outwardly facing state here. What will then happen is a sodium ion will move and bind to the outwardly facing binding site. And then what will happen is this will cause a conformational change that moves you into the inwardly facing state. Okay, like so. And then what will happen is in the inwardly facing state, the transporter will lose its affinity for sodium. So sodium will now go off into the cytoplasm. Okay, and you've moved the sodium down its concentration gradient. Okay, because sodium usually has a concentration gradient across the cell membrane. Moreover, it usually has an electrochemical gradient because remember, the electrical gradient across the cell membrane is usually negative because that's uh, because of the um, electro uh, electron transport chain okay and the proton movement uh, so sodium is a positively charged ion as well so it will want to come into the cytoplasm where the electrical potential is lower 
Okay, so you've moved the sodium down its electrochemical gradient, and the overall effect of that is that you've now moved this transporter protein into the inwardly facing state, and then what can happen is a drug molecule can bind to the inwardly facing state. That will trigger a conformational change back to the outwardly facing state, and in the outwardly facing state, the transporter will lose affinity for the drug molecule, and the drug will go off. Now, what I would just like to say before we finish is that um, the interactions between the transporter binding site for the drug molecule and the drug molecule are believed to be very similar to those interactions that we discussed for the ABC transporters. Okay, so remember we discussed hydrophobic interactions, uh, the pi stacking interactions and the cation pi interactions, those fairly non-specific interactions that you can form between uh, aromatic and hydrophobic residues lining the uh, binding site and uh, these uh, broad class of hydrophobic planar um, slightly cationic molecules that are being exported by these multi-drug transporters. Okay, so that now concludes our discussion of multi-drug transporters.